last session we started with deep lab and then uh, in general we are going to be facing three challenges when you want to do semantic segmentation one is you are going to end up with a reduced feature resolution if you want to do transfer learning because the problem with semantic segmentation is that if you have enough data probably you don't even need to reduce your feature resolution you can just train uh, a neural network a bunch of convolutions without any striding at all but the problem is that we don't have enough data why because labeling uh, images for the sake of segmentation is time consuming is more expensive than labeling uh, the objects inside an image so we want to do transfer learning therefore we are gonna take a network that is trained on ImageNet for classification task and try to modify it for semantic segmentation. So we are gonna end up with, re with reduced feature resolution. The other reason that you end up with reduced feature resolution is that you want to uh, take into account the what of the picture, what is inside that image. So you want to have a global sense of the image as well. So it's not only about the data, it's also about trying to identify the objects as a whole inside an image. So that's one problem. The other problem is that you could have objects at multiple scales. Some objects are small, some objects are bigger, and you want your network to be able to identify objects at different scales. And the other one is uh, you're going to lose some localization accuracy because these neural networks have their own, especially convolutions, have their own invariances. For instance, they are locally invariant to translations. So you're going to lose some accuracy because of localization, because of these invariances. To deal with the first problem, you can use atrous convolutions. These are convolutions when you introduce holes inside your kernel. Uh, and the objective is that you want to reduce the degree of signal sampling. For instance, you can reduce it from 32x down to 8x. So you're going to lose less information through downsampling. But how does it work? Uh, let's say you have an image, and if your stride is 2, you're going to end up with a downsampled image. Now you can have a kernel. This is just a stupid kernel for visualization purposes. So there is nothing special about this kernel. You take that, and you convolve it with the downsampled image. And let's say your kernel has a size of 7. And in the end, you're going to end up with... Uh, the convolved image with the kernel, now we can upsample it. So rather than doing that, you can do atrus convolutions. How does it work? Atrus stands for, it's a French word, and it means holes. You can introduce holes inside your kernel. That's going to give you a kernel twice the size of the original one. Now you can do a regular convolution with your image with that kernel size, and the rate is 2 because we introduced a zero between every two pixels of our kernel and the stride is still one and you don't need you don't need to do down sampling anymore and then you end up with a better looking feature map so there are two ways to think about atlas convolutions one is that you start with a small convolutions and small convolution kernel and introduce zeros inside your kernel or you can implement it more efficiently by keeping the kernel to have that same size, but then uh, you're gonna your, take your pixels, every other pixel, and that's gonna give you this formula. So you can have your input image at this pixel, and every other pixel, I don't know, every R pixels, you're gonna convolve it with your original kernel. So this is just for the sake of efficiency when you implement it. So you have two routes to implement it. One is uh, introduce zeros in your convolution, and then do a regular convolution with your image, or you can say you are introducing zeros in your image, or you are jumping pixels in your image. The cool thing about Atlas convolutions is that they're going to have the same number of parameters. So you didn't increase the number of parameters, it's the same number of parameters, and it's the same number of computation. But it's going to give you a bigger receptive field. You're going to be able to look at a larger portion of your image. Okay, that's going to take care of the reduced feature resolution. And how are we going to take care of multiple scales? 
you can take care of multiple scales by having different rates for your uh, atrus convolutions. So if your rate is six, you're gonna consider every six pixels apart. You can have a rate of 12, rate of 18, rate of 24. So each one is as if you're uh, looking at your image in different resolutions. If you look at it in a smaller resolution, you're identifying bigger objects. If you look at it in smaller resolutions, you're looking at it, looking at your image locally. That's going to help you identify smaller objects. So this is for large objects. This is for small objects. And you can combine all of them together with a simple concatenation. So you first do your convolution, atlas convolutions with these rates. You're going to end up with a bunch of feature maps. And then you're going to concatenate all of them together. And that's what a spatial pyramid pooling is. And it's called a pyramid because it looks like a pyramid. That's going to help you take care of multi-scale. Uh, to take care of the reduced localization accuracy because of convolutional neural networks invariances, you can do a post-processing step. So this is after the training is done. This is when you want to do your inference, your predictions. And then you're going to use a fully connected conditional random field. But what is that? First, let's take a, the, big, the big picture into consideration. You have an input image. You do your atlas convolutions. You end up with a coarse score map. You can do bilinear interpolation to go back to the original scale of your image. And this is when the conditional random field is going to come in to help you identify these objects. So I think if we go to the math, it's going to become more clear what exactly this conditional random field is doing. What is the final objective? We have a bunch of pixels. Let's just flatten them. So you have pixel one, pixel two, pixel three, pixel, I don't know, 1,000, 1,001, et cetera. So we flattened our prediction. And each pixel, we need to assign to it a label. Is it a background? Is this pixel an airplane, et cetera? What comes out of our model is a probability of this pixel being a background or this pixel being uh, an airplane. We want to find X. We want to find the labels. We want to know at this location, is it a background or is it an airplane? So our task is to do a label assignment for each pixel. So we want to optimize over X. How are we going to do it? We are going to introduce an energy function. And in your energy function, one thing that is important to you is the probability. We want to minimize the negative of the log of the probability of the label. I is pixel I, is one of these pixels, let's say a pixel here. X is going to be the corresponding label that we want to find. So that's our unknown. It's either an airplane or it's either a background or other objects or other categories. P is coming from the predictions of our deep neural network. So P we know. Because we trained it, it has a bunch of parameters, but we trained it. Now the parameters are fixed because we want to do inference. If x is uh, x is a number, it could be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, up until, I don't know, 21. Maybe there are 21 objects in your image, or there are 21 categories for each pixel. Now this is a number. Let's say your number comes up to be 20. You go ahead and read the 20th entry of your p because p is a multi-valued uh, probability distribution. So you're going to read the probability value. You put it in log and multiply it by negative, and it's as if you are maximizing the probability of that pixel. So if you do that, then uh, if you forget about this term, you are just finding, you are just reporting the pixel. You are reporting a label for pixel i, that's going to maximize the probability. So you're just going to look at the probabilities that your network is outputting and choosing the maximum. So this pixel is going to have, I don't know, with some probability being a background, with some probability being a, an airplane. And let's say the probability of it being a background is bigger than an airplane. So your energy function without these terms is going to output the background because it had a bigger probability. So, so far it makes sense. What is the objective of the other term? The other term is to take into account that the neighboring points matter. If you are within this object, the likelihood of you suddenly becoming a background is very low. 
it should be very low. And we want to incorporate that into our model. That's why you're gonna introduce this term, theta ij, and that's gonna take into account the proximity of these points. And two pixels are close to each other if their locations are close to each other. So pi, pj stands for the pixel location, or their colors are close to each other. Their red, green, blue values are close to each other. So if you are close to each other, you're gonna give it a bigger weight. You want to inherit some of the properties of your local neighbors. And if you are far from each other, they're gonna not affect each other that much. If two pixels are far from each other, this weight is gonna be small. So that term is gonna be small, and then you're gonna end up with the probabilities only. And mu is just an indicator function. If those two pixels are the same, then mu is gonna be one, otherwise it's zero. That's how you're gonna find x. So mathematically, it should be clear, but computationally, it's, it's gonna be a very tough task solving this problem. But apparently there is a nice algorithm, nice and fast, that's able to solve this problem very fast. That's why it's feasible. You can use it at the output of the predictions of your network. Any questions about CRFs? I had a question about just the dimensions of this thing. The, the capital P of XI is vector valued um, with the dimensions being the number of classes possible, right? Yes. And then so theta I, it has the same dimension as P or is theta I one entry and theta is the same dimension as P? I is counting your pixel. Okay. Uh, P is a vector and P of XI is a scalar depending on XI. So XI, you can think of it as the index of your vector. It's gonna identify which element of the capital P we are looking at. Yeah, okay. For instance, I, I... XI could be 100, so you're gonna pick up the 100th element of this vector. Okay, ah, so then theta i of x i is? Scalar. Scalar, okay. So that is scalar, this is also a scalar. And then I was curious what the rationale behind having the, the w1 exponential, which involves both like the distance and the color difference, but then also doing the w2 exponential, which again incorporates pixel position distance. Uh, so you are introducing more parameters. So these stigmas are gonna introduce uh, the, it's the scale mm -hmm. of, uh, it's basically telling the exponential how it is decaying, how fast it is decaying. So you're gonna have three different hyperparameters. So it's gonna give you more, more flexibility to yeah. focus on the pixel positions and to focus on the pixel positions and the colors. Okay. I guess, I guess that makes sense. You want to know like if they're just close by each other, but also if they're close by each other and of similar color. Yes. And then is II, capital I sub I, is that also a scalar or is that like an indicator variable? Is that just one, two, three, if it's a like red, green, blue, or is that the amount of red between like zero and 256 or whatever it is? No, it is the amount of red, green, blue. So it's a vector. Okay. And so it, it's a vector of three real numbers. Okay. It's three real numbers in the range of um, like whatever the, the, the pixel color could be, like zero through 255 if you're doing like the normal coloring. Yes. Or if you normalize it, it's some number from zero to one. Okay. Uh, this makes sense. Thank you. Any other questions? So we introduced three concepts and they're going to be used in other papers as well. These are fundamental concepts. One is convolutions with holes, atlas convolutions. The other one is the spatial pyramid pooling for multi-scaling and uh, CRFs. It's a post-processing step to take care of the loss of the accuracy that you had because of your neural network being invariant to tiny perturbations. Is the atlas spatial pyramid pooling um, a way of kind of, um, or a substitute for a standard convolution where you take like the convolution with this rate six, rate 12, rate 18, and rate 24 um, in serial and then add them together at the end? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, it's a different thing. It has the same computational cost, but it's gonna give you the flexibility in the field of view. Okay. So it's a way of generalizing a three by three convolution, or I guess just changing it so that it has a wider field of um, vision. 
Yes, exactly. So each out each output pixel can see like a twenty five wide window or whatever twenty four wide window instead of a three wide window. Yes. So okay. another way to think about it, you can. Uh, it's as if you're inputting to your network images of different resolution. You can have a high resolution image. You can reduce the resolution, push it through your convolution, reduce the resolution another time, push it through your convolution. But rather than pre-processing your image, you can actually apply that inside your neural network. Cool. And now you're just pushing one image. And then a network is knowing what to do. Any other questions? Okay, perfect. Let's see some results. So those results you're going to see in self-driving cars. The way that I'm going about this course is that I'm trying to there is a huge hype about deep learning. For instance, if you Google this paper, or if you Google Cityscapes, you're gonna find very nice videos on YouTube of what the applications are. But that's an, that's an easy task for you to get absorbed into the hype. I want us to go in a little bit deeper and try to understand what these methods are doing. Because if you only look at the results, they look really impressive, but how did they get there? So let's see, this is an image. That's the ground truth. Those are the labels. This is the prediction of the model before conditional random fields. And this is after conditional random fields. I think the image is too small for you to see the differences. But for instance, here you have some pixels that are getting classified to some other class. But things are going to become more clear if you have a key performance indicator. And I think these are mean intersection over union numbers on Pascal VOC data, you can have atrus spatial pyramid pooling. S is having 6, 12, 18, and 24 for its rates. L is a larger field of view that's going to have 12, 24, two times these. So the exact numbers you can get from the paper, but it has a larger field of view. And B for CRF, and CRF is helping all of them. So CRF always helps. It's going to help you get better results. And you can look at mean intersection over union. That's your baseline. If you do multi-scale, you're going to get 71.27. If you train it on a different data set, so these are just more data, you're going to increase the accuracy. Not the accuracy, mean intersection over union, the performance. If you augment your data, if you have a large field of view, if you add ASPP, and if you add CRF, so you're going to have a better performing algorithm. Any questions so far? Why is large field of view only used in that one instance? Is it just that that one data set has a bigger resolution? Oh, this large field of view is another paper. Oh, OK. And they're comparing their performance. They say that ASPP is going to do, uh, is going to take care of large field of view. Uh, so in the large field of view paper, I'm guessing they did data augmentation and they used the COCO training set and the MSC. Yes, they are doing it. Okay. And that's the number they are reporting. Now, if you remove that, change your method to ASPP. Got it. Uh, any other questions? So we introduced three topics, atlas convolutions, pyramid pooling, and CRFs. And we are going to build on atlas convolutions in the next paper. One last, one last question about that, um, really quickly. The, the heat maps are showing the values of theta or the energy function? These are the probabilities. Oh, OK. Any other questions? 